My guest today is Alexandria Storm. Alexandria, how are you? I'm very good. How are you doing? I am doing excellent. I'm uh, working from home, and it's raining here in Chicago, Illinois. Nice. Yes, it's uh, luckily it's very sunny here in Seattle, but I'm sorry to hear that the weather's not so good in, in Chicago. That's but I'm assuming you're you're also uh, based in Microsoft at Chicago. Is that correct? I'm based in Microsoft out of my home office here in well, <laughs> in my condo in Chicago. <laughs> yes, I guess coronavirus uh, makes changes things a little bit, but. <laughs> and I understand that, that you had an internship with Microsoft just recently. Yes, I did actually. Um, I just, I, yeah, I just completed my second internship um, at Microsoft and both summers, it was this summer and the summer before I worked at Bing um, in the Bellevue office. So in uh, Washington's greater Seattle area, um, it was a very um, different experience. Both summers, I got to experience the, my first summer was an in-person explore internship. It's the program for freshmen and sophomores in college and it's also um you work with two uh, one or two other people so you kind of have a more of a group project-based approach um in addition to that i also switched teams so i worked on a different type of field than a, than my first summer my first summer i was more focused on ux um ux engineering and working on front end uh a front end interface for users that users on bing would see and then this summer, I got to try something completely new and pursue an area that I have been always very interested in learning more about, which is um, natural language processing. So within artificial intelligence, there's a few different main areas, and NLP is one of the big ones. Within NLP, there's NLP also- NLP is natural language processing. Yes, natural language processing. So essentially- different ways of how computers can understand, comprehend, generate um, language. And underneath there is natural language understanding, um, which is what I was focused on. Um, and basically, um, essentially how can Bing use NLU and NLP to do things like question and answering. So for example, when you search on Google or Bing, um, sometimes you see a little box at the top that streamlines the answer and you don't have to go through the links to search. It'll just give you a short brief and it'll highlight exactly what you wanna see. Right. Um, that also includes when you search like a movie, it shows the whole box, the bar, the photos. So any sort of answers that come up, these not just anything besides the general blue links um, is what the team I was on focused on. So improving the um, the AI component of those, how to make a better experience for users. So I got this, uh, got on this team, and this last summer, uh, to the contrary, I was on a single um, person project. So I had to do everything all by myself. It was pretty oh. daunting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very daunting because um, I've never uh, done that yet um, at Microsoft. Although I had at um, the previous place I entered at. So I was very worried about how it would go because NLP, a lot of people on my team had like PhDs or master's degrees. And I'm here without technically without even my undergrad degree yet. No pressure. So I was, exactly. And they were like, oh, we want you to do this really, really hard project. Um, we know you can do it, but let's see if you can do it. Um, so it was exciting project. Um, uh, basically, the premise of it is... Um, when somebody searches right now on being, um, there's no detection for things like um, location sensitivity, uh, or there, there's not as good in-depth detection of sensitive or time sensitive search. So should a user in India see the same answer as a user in the United States? So that encompasses a those two and time sensitivity kind of has to do with things that are likely gonna change um, within the next year maybe so some or within the next day so things that um things like historical facts wouldn't need to change in the off chance that those needs don't need to be marked like time sensitive because it's unlikely that th those dates are going to be changed or those facts are going to be changed but things like how do i delete my zoom count that's an example of a time sensitive query because 
Uh, we want to make sure that the user sees the most relevant um, answer for the most relevant uh, software or uh, version of Zoom. They want to see. They don't want to see the first how to delete Zoom from the first version of Zoom because that could be a completely unrelated and wrong answer. Sure. Um, so that's kind of the sort of thing I did, and I built um, or I, I fine tuned and built um, two what th they're called binary classification models. So they're able to classify whether or not it is region agnostic or region sensitive, time agnostic or time sensitive. Um, and then basically the process for doing this uh, took a lot of uh, data collection, which was something that I was really surprised about because I'm personally not a very big data science person. Um, I tried data science in college and I kind of was like, oh, I, I'm not really interested in this. I don't really care about data science. I'm more about software, computer and science. suddenly... <laughs> it's your and job. Then, <laughs> yes. And then suddenly it was my job. And at first I was like, oh no, this this might not be so much fun. Um, but I actually learned um, quite a bit from this experience because I got to create kind of like little experiments or websites that would have these paid judges internally or kind of vendors from Microsoft that would judge a ton of data so I could collect a ton of labeled data that I could then thus feed into my model. And that's how you train the model. It's not even more in a lot of, I guess, uh, larger tech companies, a lot of these models and these um, for what they use in artificial intelligence are already, the base of it is already created. People are not building everything from the ground up, um, which might be surprising to people. You're more kind of like tweaking things and adding the, mo the most critical change of quality actually comes from data. So I learned um, that c collecting data, not just any data, um, a lot of data and quality data. And to me, something that I saw, um, I thought that I brought my own perspective to it is that quality data must include, I guess, a diverse audience or um, diverse data, um, something that's an accurate portrayal of what your user base is going to be. Um, so one thing that Bean was lacking uh, that I noticed um, is that there hadn't been much work done in terms of um, improving, uh, especially the the um, answer quality for other languages, um, especially languages who are non um, Latin based languages. It's easier for um, so things like the difference uh, between English and uh, Spanish. Queer, uh, it's, it's a little bit easier for a, a machine to be able to um, draw those lines than when you have a model that's never been trained on Arabic or Chinese, which uses a completely different script or uh, oh, essentially. Um, and essentially, uh, there's also different cultural things with different languages and um, that don't always carry over. Um, so actually, something I study in school a lot is uh, something I've been adding to my education is the study of linguistics, which a lot of people in computer science um, kind of ignore. Uh, I guess uh, at least it's not as popular as I think it should be studied. Um, but it's a new field. Uh, it's a new joint kind of um add-on to NLP artificial intelligence that's becoming really popular because linguistics is the study of language um, and that means a lot of different things and it can definitely and it's exactly what you need to be studying to be working on NLP to understand um, the different aspects of linguistics there's everything from morphology phrenology and then there's also social linguistics like the study of the social implementation 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 sorry implications of um, language. So things like different dialects being stigmatized or ignored based upon other factors, even outside of language, like race, class, uh, gender. Um, that's an what example. Do by, like, what do you mean by stigmatized? So for in example, this in this context, um, one very, um, one, one example that is very easy to grasp is that in the United States, what is considered ac academic language or standard English or the mid-Atlantic accent um, is, or what you would see on a broadcaster for television. Yeah, the uh, newscasters is, all speak yes. the same accent in the U.S. Exactly. It's actually technically a made-up uh, dialect. Nobody actually <laughs> speaks like that uh, normally, <laughs> like throughout 24-7. Um, but that that sort of type of dialect of English um, is considered to be mo the most intelligent, considered to be the most high class considered to be the most respectable. Um, wow. However, speakers of African-American vernacular English are people who speak, who are black, who speak um, in economic, economics or AVE as it's called, um, are frowned upon, seen as less intelligent, seen as less wow. formal, all of that. When 
from a completely logical perspective, it's there's nothing lesser or less intelligent of that language. It's evolved right. from um, from basically from the historical context that it came from. So um, oh, essentially, well, are they, you saying that's, that this is um, left out of a lot of natural language models because they just sort of dismiss it as saying this isn't real English? Is that, is that the idea that our our models are flawed because that they have that bias? Well, I okay. I guess I would say that it's uh, it's important to keep in mind. Um, that not everybody speaks the same uh, dialects of a language okay. and also, also that and it's something to be keeping in mind whenever you're designing models and making sure you're getting the, an accurate representation of data for example if um, if we only train um models to understand mid-atlantic or standard english hmm. when the common when a common person who also speaks english technically or speaks a mixture between ebonomics and English, then they're going to be marked as the, the the model might not even understand them or might not even, for example. So in order to fit the needs of um, of users, it's really important to keep that in mind. And that in this instance, for example, you would want to have a, a diverse set of data that included languages of all dialects of the United States. If you wanted to have a perfectly, a, a technically perfect model of um, English, uh, American English for your um, users. So it's okay. things like that, and it's not just English. It's in uh, sometimes it's not even dialects; it's other languages. Um, so, like in India, there are many different dialects of language. In China, there um, are dialects between towns that that change, like, it's very that it's, people can't even understand each other in the next town. So essentially, I just think that um, too often language uh, a lot of language is simplified and not seen into a broader context. Um, and I think it's really important when you are programming language to to accurately and um, effectively portray how people really use language, um, because models are all just a reflection of the person who programs it. And that's why I think that having diversity in artificial intelligence is so incredibly important. Um, mm -hmm. Because, for example, my team didn't have any Spanish speakers on the team. Spanish is one of the most it's like the second most spoken language in the world, right. and um, that you know, if we had more Spanish-speaking engineers, people who understood Spanish from Spanish-speaking Latin American countries, we would be able to build, uh, help build the entire model, the um, different models within Bean to greater fit the needs of people from Latin American countries. Because now the the way that it's set up is largely United States based, and that's why the majority of our market is within the United States because we don't cater towards a diverse array of users. Hmm. So. Essentially, it's it carries to a lot of different things, and I try to intentionally remove my biases as an, someone from the United States by thinking, right. if I'm not from the U.S., do I want to see this answer? Probably not. I probably want to see it for my country. When I search, when is the election? I don't want to see the United States election. I want to see right. the New Zealand election. Um, mm. And Google additionally has the same problem. Um, it's uh, to different different degrees for different areas. Um, so it's something that's being improved by the day, essentially um, across different platforms, not just search engines, but um, yeah, essentially that's kind of what I worked on this summer and I ended up doing it and it was really awesome. I got to present at a showcase um, for the VP of uh, WebXT at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And it was just a very cool opportunity to accumulate what I had worked on this summer. I learned a lot and I was able to like um, increase the numbers basically for how precise my model was significantly by the end of the summer. Um, so it was a great experience because I got to do something that was both technical, but I had, could 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 foresee an an actual scenario where I was helping real people across the world. Um, it was very satisfying to me because I feel like um, I want to do technology to help other people and to help um, improve improve life for other people. Um, and I don't think that technology should be just made for um, Americans or upper class people or whatever, you know, so I, I, that's why I really like that project. I was able to really think about how can I make technology that's not just going to benefit me, but for all people. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, I, I didn't know your work on this project. I came here to talk to you about another topic, but this is so fascinating. I'm glad it went down this, <laughs> down this way. It's really good. Um, and I think Microsoft wants the same thing. Microsoft wants to be a global company. Clearly, our employees are from all over the world. Our customers are from all over the world. But sometimes, you know, uh, so many people live in, in this kind of bubble in Redmond. It's easy to get tunnel vision and forget yeah. that. And yes. uh, it's good that your your uh, your team has recognized that and you're contributing to that. So so what you built is part of Bing now. 
it's actually went into the product. Is that correct? Um, I'm not sure because I, I, I'm not able to be in contact. I don't think about the details of the project after I'm working there. Um, uh, okay. but, um, no, I didn't, I didn't actually ship it by the end, but I completed the, the internal project. So it's okay. ready to be shipped. Um, so I'm sure I, I'm, 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 I think it's likely that it will be on Bing sometime in the future. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. And Bing will get a little yeah. bit better. And, uh, yes. uh, and your, um, your internship is ended. You're back in school now, right? Yes. Um, so now I'm back in school, working virtually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the first uh, time. You say in school. You're <laughs> you're yes. on online school. Uh, are you coming back to Microsoft after you graduate? Um, cannot say for sure yet, but um, it definitely is a a very appealing option to me. <laughs> that, sound, that sounds like I'm you're very, a really good fit. I, um, and I, I am. I I really love love the people and love the work culture. It is a great place to work. I I work for Microsoft as well. And I'm, I'm yes. Happy there. Um, the uh, before you go, I wanted to talk to you about. I know you were planning a conference that got side railed by this crazy pandemic that's going around. Can you tell me a little about that? Yeah. So um, before coronavirus hit, um, I planned. Uh, me and two other colleagues from Berkeley planned a conference um, that was centered around uh, people of color and women, queer and trans folks, basically people underrepresented in the field of entrepreneurship and venture capitalism. Mm -hmm. And to me, it really was appealing to kind of shift my focus also into entrepreneurs of color because um, a lot of resources have started to kind of, there's been a lot of programs now at big companies for women in technology or women in entry level software positions, but there's almost no support for women or people of color or queer and trans people who want to be executives, want to be founders, want to be venture capitalists. Um, and while it's obviously important to have also software engineers, a lot of that's no reason why we shouldn't also be equally supporting people to be um, entrepreneurs and learn more of also business management side of things. Um, because we're finding from what I've seen, it seems like a lot of these diversity programs get a lot of people in the door, maybe get them into the company, but then there's no upward mobility for them ever. And that's why we're still you know, seeing very little people of color in executive positions and leadership positions. Um, so while it's nice and it's very good that now we're seeing a lot more uh, software engineers, entry-level people, mid-level people, um, it's it's a lot of people still want to, you know, do become an entrepreneur or start their own startup or, but if you come from a background where you don't have friends or family who work in business or have connections of any sort yeah. or know things even about general finance terminology, the jargon that's used within the finance and venture capitalist world, um, it's very hard for somebody from a different background to come in and be able to be treated the same way. Um, to be treated just as seriously as somebody else um, who comes from a family where they've grown up used to being around these types of people. Um, so basically we wanted to create this conference to not only provide workshops and speakers that would give them the tools uh, to learn more about this, um, learn more about how to become an entrepreneur, how to uh, get in contact with VCs. But um, I also wanted to emphasize that uh, I've been to a lot of conferences uh, for women in technology, people of color and uh, technology. And while it's, they're very great and they're very good sources of community, a lot of times they don't offer any concrete support, especially mm -hmm. after the conference. Um, so what we wanted to emphasize was that we were going to bring in um, uh, judges who were VCs, entrepreneurs, people who are experienced in this field and be judges for a pitch competition, which that they could pitch their actual startup, uh, the on these entrepreneurs that yeah. were at the conference, and they could potentially get funding, they could be get mentorship, oh, wow. exposure. Nice. Um, so we had, yeah, so I was in the works of partnering with a lot of different people, VC funds that were very interested and were going to come um, listen and mentor to these pitches because it's like for them, a lot of these VCs now are kind of saying, oh, we, we definitely want to, we need more, um, people in a portfolio from underrepresented backgrounds. We want to invest in these people, but we don't know where to find them, especially uh, young people. Young people, especially young people of color in college who want to be entrepreneurs, don't, the majority of the time, don't know a VC. Don't know oh, absolutely. how to You got these folks VC. over here, trying to find these folks over here, and you're going to be the glue that connects them. Precisely, exactly. So um, I was doing a lot of networking to bring, bring in these different people, basically to... Um, 
bring these two groups together. And um, also I got sponsorships from different companies like uh, Microsoft uh, was in the works with HubSpot, um, uh, some other companies, uh, smaller startups, basically to provide funding so we could fly out um, entrepreneurs, um, the most in need entrepreneurs where they could come pitch and come to this conference. So we had a, a scholarship application and we had applicants from all around the country. Um, so it, it's really sad because these people could have come and had this great experience. We would have gone and meet them all. I, at the least, I would have been able to connect them with some really great folks in, in the world because um, I was working, got over over the time of playing the conference, I was just reaching out to so many people and trying to get people involved. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a shame because coronavirus came and then we had to cancel it um, um, because they weren't, wasn't possible to hold an in-person event and it was too last minute to hold an online online event and things were just really crazy um, mm. in, in, in the beginning of April. So yeah, um, very sad about that. But Do you think someone end, will I, go move it forward after this? Do you think someone um, in the future will take it forward, either, either virtually or in person? Um, for this exact uh, this exact team and project, no. Um, but for a different sort of thing in the future, similar to this that I could participate in, I possibly I, I am interested in doing something like that. However, um, even though I did, I, I would been we would been able to pull the conference off as three undergrads with no like prior VC as a VC experience. Um, uh, we were able to kind of figure it out ourselves, but I think in the future, if I wanted to do that, I would try to do one of these conferences, if a conference through uh, a company with more funding. So most of my time wasn't just worried about getting the funding and doing those logistic things, yeah. paying for, um, you know, all of those things, paying for food and everything. Um, because the main focus that I'm passionate about is connecting these entrepreneurs with VCs, with other established entrepreneurs that's the most satisfying thing to me um so yeah if, if i could do it again um or if i could do it in the future i would try to do it where i was in a better position with um with finances i guess in terms of just paying okay. speakers uh, all those things um so yeah unfortunately not in the near future <laughs> but um um yeah i was um bummed about that but <laughs> uh, well, well, I didn't mean to bum you out, but it sounded like a great idea, and that's why I was—I uh, brought it up. I know you put a lot of work into it, and I, I've been—I have helped organize a lot of conferences over the last ten years or so, mm -hmm. and I recognize there's a thousand little details that nobody sees. There, mm -hmm. there are expenses. There's uh, things that go wrong and have to be fixed, sometimes in advance, sometimes at the last second, and exactly, it's, it's a lot of work. Exactly. I just—I thought you know I could. I just thought that it was a little bit more important for me to prioritize my health and everything yeah, after yes. everything that was going on in my family. Um, Cause it was just, it was uh, doing that pretty much full time of a uh, kind of doing that work almost full time while doing school on top of it um, was just burning me out um, completely. Right. And um, you know, I want to put up the, of course I want it to come off. Like I can do anything. I can do any amount of work and just be completely fine and keep going. Um, but it, the coronavirus kind of came along and gave me a reason to kind of take a step back and take care of my health and everything like that um, and recuperate um, for school and everything like that. So Good choice. I don't, yeah. So I don't think it's the end of my um, work within there. I just think it's more important to just find different ways that maybe work better with my health and my schedule and that sort of thing. And um, But I don't regret the experience at all. I learned a lot, met a lot of people. It was a great time. Uh, excellent. Is there anything we were just about at time? Is there anything we haven't talked about that you'd like to cover? Um, I guess I can just wrap up by saying, um, I just think it's, um, it's really important to, um, hire and promote, um, people of, people of color, people of, uh, women, um, queer and trans people, um, especially queer and tra trans people are so often ignored um, in this new age of, I guess, diversity and inclusion uh, that I've seen kind of sprout up. Um, to me, unfortunately, a lot of it feels very performative um, as, a, as a queer woman of color. Um, I am all three of those things. And I, I there's been so many times where I've been the only person of my demographic on the entire floor, on the entire engineering team. At one time, I was the only I was one of two engineer, two 
woman at the company at a startup I worked at as an engineer, definitely the only queer person. Um, so it's it's very isolating, but I always um, look to find more of us, look to find community within us. And also, um, yeah, I guess I say, um, I hope that these companies start doing better in terms of um, their commitment towards improving diversity, because to me, it's just every year June hits, they change their profile picture to rainbow. Um, they pass out some rainbow stickers and then that's pretty much it. Um, but there's no support for, there's no comfortable way for, um, I guess, queer and trans individuals to, to talk about things that they experience at work that, um, may not be comfortable for them, um, may feel very isolated, are not getting promoted the same. Um, like we have all these other issues that are not being addressed and they're not being fixed by just saying, oh, we love pride like every June. Um, so it's something that I'm getting increasingly frustrated with. Um, same thing goes for, you know, whatever Black History Month, Asian American History Month, um, whatever, for all kinds of women's uh, things for um, women engineers. Um, they just oftentimes feel like a way, not all companies, but many companies, um, I've noticed they just feel like a way of them covering themselves to make sure that they have a good public image. Um, and then when you look inside the company, you see little to no work being done. You talk to the people of these backgrounds, they say that little to no work is being done. Um, so I just wish that, uh, I really actually appreciate when companies are very transparent and they say, look, we don't have many people of color working here, especially in engineering. We don't have... We have barely any queer trans people. We have very little woman engineers, but we're trying to do better. And here's how we're doing it. Um, I'd rather people just be honest than saying we're so diverse. And then you see their numbers and they're not. Um, right. And it's like 20% woman engineers. I, you know, so it's, it's hard to work at a place where they think that they're already done being better. Like that's not, it's not a very, you know, good, that, that even says more about the company itself is that, you know, do the bare minimum and then, um, or do, do very little and then take credit for it. Um, right. So yeah, that's just, that's is kind that, of the is reason that why I'm you put the way. quotes around when you said diversity and inclusion, you, you put some air quotes around that. Yes. Cause I don't think it's, I don't know. I think that that term is just thrown around very loosely and it doesn't have hold much mean at all. Um, as especially the, like even in, for example, like in higher, higher graduate school, they will call things diversity inclusion when they really, when they're, it's not really diversity inclusion, like um, in graduate business schools, they'd be like, we're so, their only diversity numbers are, we're so diverse. We have um, a percentage of our employees, our parents, and a percentage of, of our employees are international students, something like that. Um, but that's not, what they're failing to mention is that those people who are parents are probably upper class um, white women who are whatever. That's not that's not for a lot of people what we see as diversity. Um, right. So it's it's um, it's really hard because, yeah, they it just feels a lot of the time it's so much of a PR stunt um, and it's 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 not really genuine. Um, so I've been in the search of kind of. I've, I've slowly been able to kind of pick out, see when it's really genuine or not. And luckily um, at, at least at Microsoft, um, I've seen that it's definitely significantly better than many places um, in terms of being genuinely caring about that sort of thing. They were able to invest in my conference and able to help me out with that, which was really telling of their commitment to me as one of their employees, as someone who's working there. Um, but there's, been plenty of other companies I've had friends work at or colleagues and I've heard stories and it's just um, even major companies where there's major pay inequality, um, lack of a major love, just of uh, uh, career mobility for different groups. So mm -hmm. yes, that's, that's essentially what I mean by that. I think that um, a lot of it is just publicity. Would they be doing this work if they did not get to publicize it online? Probably not. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's kind of how I feel about it. Well, you obviously have a lot of passion for this. I, I wonder. <laughs> I know you have a, you're a full-time student. You just got done with this internship, and you had a conference. But are you are you writing or speaking publicly on this? Um, um I I have been here and there, but I haven't been as much because just been busy with school. But yeah. um, I hope to kind of get back into it a little bit more. I honestly just need platforms. I I'm not aware of as many platforms and places to do it. However. I have been invited to be on a few panels with girls who code. So I That's should good. be doing that for their national campaign. Um, I, uh, so hopefully that, um, 
works out in the end. Yeah, and you could create your own platform, like a blog, for example. Is yeah, I actually already have my own Medium oh, blog. Tell me where the uh, what the URL URL is, and I'll yeah, share I'll it. send it to you for sure. Thank you so much. Of course, and uh, I feel like we should have done two shows. So we talked about so much stuff here today, but this is good. This is a great show with a lot of information, and I really appreciate you spending time with us, Alexandria. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity, and, and thank you for taking the time to talk to me. <laughs> you stay safe. All right. Thank you. I like to think that I should be building technology that I would want my friends to use or my friends would like to use. I like to build technology, keeping my friends in mind because I think that it's very easy to get out of touch with the customer or the user or the end goal. And if I think that I keep in mind, keep it at a personal level of thinking, would my friends like, would my friends use this and be satisfied or would they tell me why are you making this part so difficult why is this so complicated um why are you, why did you choose to do this um so i feel like keeping it thinking about it like if i were to demo this to a friend or a family member um what would they really say about it because friends will tell you the truth um hopefully um so i think that i just personally try making technology that my friends could use, my friends would enjoy. Um, I think that's a good mindset in some, in some aspects of technology.